The first Sunday in my last appointment, I walked into the sanctuary, and lo and behold, there is a huge hole in the ceiling. I hadn't noticed driving up to the building that the steeple was no longer there. And I had been married in that building, and I drove by it very regularly when I lived there because my last appointment was only six miles away. And I looked up at the hole and I asked what happened, and they said the steeple fell through the roof. Now, the steeple had been part of the original building, and when they built the new sanctuary, new being now 20-some years old, they put the old steeple on top. And the steeple, the weight of a brick steeple with a bell inside, and bells are a lot bigger when they're on the ground than they are when they're up in the air on a steeple. The weight was too much for the roof, and it collapsed, and it came through. It didn't fall all the way through, but they got it down in time. It now rests in someone's yard. He uses it to plant flowers in. And I stood there my first Sunday, and I looked up at the hole in the ceiling, and I said, those of you who said the roof will fall in before a woman becomes pastor of this church were absolutely right. But I asked later, why did the steeple fall through? You know, the obvious answer is it's too heavy. But they told me then that the architect, when he looked at the steeple, had planned for steel trusses in the ceiling. But the lowest bid had wooden trusses, and they went with the lower bid. That's what Jesus is talking about. You don't want to go with a lower bid in your life, do you? Now, do you remember Hurricane Andrew some years ago? Devastated Homestead, Florida. But there was an interesting thing that happened that the houses that collapsed were the big, expensive mansions. They were blown down in the wind, and the water carried the parts off. But you know what houses did not fall down? The little bitty houses built by volunteers with Habitat for Humanity. Now, we could just leave it there, and you could say that, well... Of course they stayed because they were built in the name of God. That's not quite true, although it has something to do with the story. They stayed put because they were built by volunteers who had no idea what they were doing in construction. And especially the houses that were built by women who had no experience in construction stood up because if the code said you needed three nails, they put in about 27. Those houses weren't going to go anywhere because they wanted to make sure that those houses were safe and secure. And instead of doing the least they could do, they did the most they could do. That's what Jesus is really talking about in this story. And he uses an example. And again, we have to remind ourselves that this is not an example to warn about those who have been hurt in storms and floods and hurricanes and pandemics. They're not God's judgment upon us. But Jesus often used examples that people could understand in his parables. And they could understand what it was in this culture and in that location to build a house on firm rock or to build a house on sand. It was harder to build on rock. It was uneven. They had to work to make a place for the foundation. They had to, to hone those rocks down. It's much easier to build on sand. Sand is flat and easy to build on until the water comes. How many of you have ever walked along the water's edge and felt the sand give way between your feet, between your toes? Can you imagine being in a house built on such a weak foundation? So Jesus is telling us, build your house on a strong foundation. Don't just listen to me. Do what I say. Now, there are some folks who disregard this part of the teaching because they think it's works righteousness, that we earn what we get from God. No, this is another statement about grace. Grace is not what gets us to heaven. Grace is not what saves us. Grace is what saves us. But the outpouring from grace is a life that is transformed, and that is a life that does indeed mirror the teachings of Jesus in their everyday lives. So if you're going to read some scripture this week, I would say go back and read Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. So many people are asking me now with the pandemic and the riots and everything else that's going on, are we living in the end times? And my answer is always the same, I have no idea. Because Jesus said only the Father in heaven knows. He didn't even know. But he did give us things to live by and to build our lives on, and that teaching is one. So skip Revelation right now. It's just going to scare you and keep you up at night worrying. Go to Matthew and open to chapter 5. It begins, blessed are those, as he teaches them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are meek, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, not peacekeepers, peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. And then he goes on to teach them. He teaches them so many things there. The world tells you this is okay, but I tell you you got to do more. If the world forces you to go one mile, go two. 
He says, don't judge. He says, don't worry. And especially now, don't we need to hear Jesus saying to us, don't worry. Who by worrying can add one moment to his or her life? These are the teachings that keep us safe. And what else does he teach us there? But they say to him, how should we pray? And he said, don't pray like the hypocrites. They like to be heard. They like to stand up and sound important. But when you pray, go to your Father in secret, and he will reward you in secret. And pray like this, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. If we do these things, we will build for ourselves a life that is certain and secure. I used to do something with confirmation classes called Christians are like pizza. And we would make pizza at the time. And I said to a group of boys in middle school once, it was an all-boy class, I don't recommend that. All boys in middle school. That's where my hair turned gray, really. But I said to them, what is the first thing that you do that makes a pizza? And they said, the sauce. So I took a scoop of sauce and I poured it on the counter and I said, all right, it's going to be hard to cut. And they said, no, that thing that goes under it, that thing that goes under it, you know what it's called. I said, what's it called? And the mother who was there that day said, it's called a crust. And they said, that's right, the crust. I said, why do you have to have a crust? And they said, oh, it's like a foundation. And I said, absolutely, it's a foundation. What is the foundation of the Christian faith? Now, these rocket scientists thought and thought and thought, and they said, believing in God, I said, great. That means Jews are Christians, and Buddhists are Christians, and Muslims are Christians, because they all have gods. And they said, no, that's not it. Well, Thomas, their five-year-old brother of one of the confirmants was there, and Thomas kept saying, Pastor Tawi, I know the answer. And I hated it when he got to the age where he could pronounce the R's in my name. And I said, let them wrestle with it. And they were saying, well, prayer is the foundation of the Christian faith. And I said, well, prayer is important, but lots of, lots of faith traditions have prayer. They kept going along, and Thomas was saying, Pastor Tawi, let me tell you, I know the answer, I know the answer, I know the answer. Finally, I said, all right, Thomas, what's the answer? And he said, Jesus was dead, and then he was alive again. I thought, let's not just confirm him with his brothers. Let's ordain him and make him a bishop. Because at five years old, he understood that the foundation of the Christian faith is the proclamation that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead and lives. And because of that, we need to go back and we need to read what he taught us and we need to make it part of our lives. We need to understand that those, as we read in Corinthians, the Jews that were wandering on their way to the promised land, 40 years, they were hot and they were tired and they were thirsty and they were hungry. And God provided manna for them from heaven and Moses struck the rock and water came forth. And Paul writes to the church looking back, those especially who were coming from the Jewish faith into accepting Christ as their Messiah, the promised one. And Matthew's gospel is all about saying this is the one who was promised. What does he say? But they drank from the same spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. Christ who has been with the world since its beginning. Christ who is part of God. Christ who died and who was raised. That is a foundation to build a life on, and that is not going with the lowest bidder. The lowest bidder is the world saying, it's all right to hate. It's all right to be selfish and self-centered and self-seeking. The world tells us it's all right to call people enemies and to get what you can. But Jesus says, I tell you, it's a different way. And through him, we can have life that is abundant in this world and eternal in the world to come. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as what? The prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord. Amen. We're going to sing now.